continual reminders of God's faithfulness to keep spiritual discouragement at bay. I'll read one and then we'll go through the lesson uh, verse by verse of text. But I'll read uh, Malachi chapter 3 and we'll read a little bit of that later towards the end of the lesson today. Uh, Malachi 3 6 is, For I am the Lord and I change not. Therefore, ye sons of Jacob are not consumed. Amen. Let's pray. Lord, thank you today for your word. Thank you for providing a way for us to hear, to listen. But you said not to be only hearers, but doers also. We ask God that you help us perform these words. Let it penetrate our heart. Let it affect us. Let it move us. Let it stir us. I ask that you would help me teach this morning. Your will, your way be done. Cover this place with your blood. Point your angels to keep out every fiery dart, every word, every opposition. We ask that you would fill this place and touch every heart and every mind. In Jesus' name, amen. Everybody read the lesson for this week? What a lesson, wasn't it? Malachi? Wow. That's... Malachi was the last prophet in the Old Testament. He was the last person that God had, could speak through. He was the only prophet left, the only spokesperson left that God could speak through and use before his 400 years of silence began. Remember after Malachi, there was nothing heard from God until Matthew. The next prophet we hear of is John the Baptist. And, you know, thinking about it, and I think this 400 years of God was finding a way and making a way for him to come to earth as, as a baby in Matthew. You remember the Christmas story? But this is the last time the people are ever going to be um, uh, hear from the Lord. And there was a few important things that the Lord needed to, to tell the people before he went on this 400 year, um, uh, I don't know what you call it, break. But um, there was, number one was money. Why would God find money to be important to make sure that was priority. And then the other thing was marriage and family, leadership, those kinds of things that he had to share with the people before he left. Malachi's name means my messenger. If you read through the, the, the chapter Malachi 1, 2, and 3, we find Israel in another bad situation. They're at another bad time in their life. Israel has gone through so much pain and trouble. They get to the mountaintop, but didn't spend very long there when they found themselves in the valley, in the dark places once again, and the Lord had to and had to literally rebuke them and call them out on some things that they were doing wrong. And I always wonder, you know, how my wife and I were talking about it this morning. Then people had it bad. They had a lot of you know, idols and other... They had a lot of opposition. I think likewise today we kind of have the same thing, if not worse. Hey man, we have trouble. But anyways, at this time, Israel's in another bad place. And they were filled with so much unbelief. If you read through even chapter 1, you... you you'll see how the people are arguing with God back and forth and the Lord would talk to them and they would talk back. They had no respect. They had no, no, no emotion, no love. There was nothing. They were, they were just empty. They were just outright talking back to God. They had no, no respect for the Lord and the Lord would say to them, but I have loved you and immediately the people will say, how did you love us? We don't see it. We, don't, we, we can't feel it anymore. You don't love us like you used to. How, we don't see your love. We can't feel you. You love the enemy more than you love us. And those are the kinds of words that they talk back to the Lord with. It. You know, their actions seemed like they were bored with God. Like, ah, oh, not again. 
Do we have to keep Bill? Where are you, God? Your, your food is not what it used to be. Your provisions are not what it used to be. You don't love us anymore. I guess you just forgot about us. And Well, so what? If that's how it's going to be, then, you know, lots of unbelief. There was no emotion. There was no love. There was no fervency. There was no prayer. There may have been some praise and worship, but it was empty. Like the Bible says, tingling, sounding, tingling symbols. And the Lord says, but I provided for you. I, I, I blessed your land. I gave you fruits on the table. And if you read through the, the verse 11 or 12, people responded to God and said, how did you give? Your food is polluted. That's how ignorant the people have become. The Lord said, I provided for you. But the people turn around and say, yeah, but your food is tasteless. Your food is polluted. We don't enjoy your food anymore. We, we want something different. We want something better. What, you're giving, what you've been doing for us and providing for us has become old. We want something new. So they were in that state. So what we offer and how we offer it does matter a whole lot. Yes, what we offer and how we offer it. Whether we offer it with joy, with gladness, with excitement, with fervor, with prayer. If our prayers going up effectively, fervently, that means with weeping and crying, with fire, with, with, with a lot of uh, heart in it. How we offer it. You know, one of the Bible says to them in the same chapter, you're offering me polluted offerings. What you're giving to me is, is not good. It's empty. It's shallow. It's weak. Um... You know, take uh, your job for example. I believe there's two kinds of people that go to that have a job. You know, what the one group they're excited to go to work. They wake up early. They're there early on time before shift. They're excited about it. They share ideas. They contribute. They love being there. They they, they see a future in their job. They see themselves re retiring from that job. They share ideas and plans, and they're good to work with. They don't complain. They they do everything by the book. You know, they, they make friends with the coworkers. They're they're a blessing to the to the job. But then you have other people that just hate going to work. Don't like going to. They complain every. They try to make every excuse not to go to work. And when they do go to work, there's no excitement. There's no joy, there's no, there's no partic participation, there's no, uh, they don't share anything, they don't have any ideas, they don't see a future on that job, they're like, I want to get out of this place as soon as I can. They find faults, this is wrong with this, I don't like this, I don't like my boss, I don't like, they're only there for a paycheck, basically. And that's kind of the way it is in the church. We have some that come early before church starts. They're excited. They come to pray. They come to contribute. They come, they, they're a part of it. They love being here. They're with the cause. They're, they're here. They want to learn. They want to contribute. They have ideas. They, they're part of the planning. And they see themselves retiring. From here. And then of course we do have the other people that don't like coming to church. That when you tell them it's church time, they're like, again, I'm tired of church. I don't like, they're not excited about it. They'll come on time. They're probably late to church, not early. They grumble, they complain about things and they see everything wrong in the church and, and they don't see themselves lasting a part of the church. Am I right? 
That sounds true. So very true. In chapter 1, verse 1, in Malachi chapter 1, verse 6, actually, here we find God talking to his people. Uh, he says, A son honored his father, and ser a, a servant his master. If then I be a father, where is my honor? And if I be a master, where is my fear? Say, the Lord of hosts unto you, O priests, that despise my name. And you say, Wherein have you despised thy name? In verse 7, you, you offer polluted bread upon my altar. And you say, Wherein have we polluted thee? And that you say, the table of the Lord is contemptible. Contemptible means to be disgraced or pitiful or um, just thought of as awful and low and not good. <coughs> so here we find the Lord talking to his people who no longer obviously are giving the way they once used to give. They're not giving their best. They're giving just empty worship, empty praise. There's no heart in it. There's no joy. They're just there to, to get a check. They're not offering their best. They don't come with worship. They don't come with praise. There's nothing on their lips. It's not heartfelt when they come to church. There's only plaining and grumbling, and that's what they were doing. God wasn't important in their lives no longer. They had no, no, no unction. They, they had no fervor. They, church wasn't important and God was no longer important. But back in the days, thousands of years before them, like uh, in Abraham's days, people back then loved God. They loved the temple. The Bible says they worshipped Almost daily, they broke bread daily. They came together, they talked about the Lord, and they worshiped God. They have a worship meetings, they offered incense, they came together as a family, as a country, as a nation, with the priest ahead of everyone, worshiping, offering sacrifices, sacrificial givings. They brought their best, the unblemished animals, and the pure, and the first, uh, the first fruits, and Everybody was excited. They offered a praise. They danced. They worshiped. They prayed. They wept. They offered gifts to show God's appreciation. They, showed, they gave gifts to the Lord to show their appreciation, to show their love, to show their respect to the Lord. Chapter 1 he continues to say, uh, verse 7, people were still having church. People were still giving. People did still have um, a temple. And the Lord was still around. Verse number 8 says, If ye offer the blind for sacrifice, is it not evil? And if you offer the lame and sick, is it not evil? Offer it now unto thy governor. Will he be pleased with thee, or accept thy person, except the Lord of hosts? Why do you offer me polluted things? You're bringing animals that are blind. You're bringing offerings and things that are lame. You're offering and giving to me things that are sick. And the Lord says, why don't you try giving it to your human governors, your human leaders? Why don't you try offering it to your governor? See if he'll accept it. If your governors don't want it, why should I accept it? Why would I want what you're trying to offer, even if your governors don't? And the people around you don't even want it. Lord's talking to them. What you're giving to me is infected. It's in poor condition. It's 
Drop down to verse 10. It says, Who is there even among you that would shut the doors or not? And neither do you kindle fire on mine altar for not. I have no pleasure in you, says the Lord of hosts, neither will I accept an offering at your, heart, at your hand. Who is there even among you that would shut the doors? The Lord goes on to tell him in verse 10, if you're not going to take this seriously, don't even do it anymore. It's better that you shut the doors. Is there anyone among you that can just shut the doors? Neither do you kindle fire on my altar. If you can't take this serious enough, if you can't use this altar the way it should be used, if there's no one coming or has the compassion enough to come make their way to the altar anymore, if there's no one willing to offer praise and worship and come to me with their heart and weeping and crying, and you do it just out of lip service, he says, might as well close the church doors because it's not effective, it's meaningless, it's empty. Right. If you don't want to give me good things anymore, you might as well just shut the door because you don't offer anything that is good anymore. Stand. I'm not even, it's like the Lord is saying, I'm not even important to you anymore. I'm, I'm not even on your priority this week. I'm not even on your agenda for this week. How many of you last week put the Lord on your list, your to-do list? Did anybody make time to put God, anything to do with the Lord on your list? Maybe one hour or two. We go on verse 12. It says, but you have profaned it. In that you say the table of the Lord is polluted. And the fruit is polluted. Even his meat is pitiful. Man, these people talking back to the Lord. Your table is polluted. Your offerings and things you give is polluted. We don't like it. And even your fruit and your meat is despicable. It's pitiful. We don't. Verse 12 says, You're profaning the things that I do for you. You're disrespecting the things that I'm providing for you. You no longer are thankful for the things that I've done for you in your life. You look past and you look through the things that, the places that I've brought you through. You don't remember the things that I've performed in your life. But yet you profane the things that I continue to do. You profane it. You're disrespecting it. You even say my table is polluted. My fruits are polluted. You say it's defiled. You despise what I give to you. You overlook it. You ignore it. And you disregard it. It's like saying, so what, God? You're not really performing anything in my life anymore. I haven't felt you anymore. You don't hear my prayers. You don't. We have a list of... Um, Words against the Lord. Just like these people were doing. They said, so what? We don't care. The Lord doesn't hear us. He's talking back to the Lord. Verse 13. It says, he said also, Behold, what a weariness it is. You have snuffed at it, said the Lord of hosts, and you brought that which was torn and lame and the sick, and thus he brought an offering. Should I accept this at your hand? Just telling them, 
calling them out. You, you snuffed at it. Anybody have an idea what snuffing out the Lord is? I couldn't find anything in studying and I think it when you say something like like you know, kind of like that. You know how a cow somehow, or sometimes a horse would sniff and blow worms on you. You ever had that happen to you? Kind of snuff and just, like, you know, kind of disgusting. Like, ah, again? Church again? Is it Sunday already again? When you say, I'm tired of this. I'm weary, like the Bible says, weariness of it. Like, again? Church again? Say this again, do I have to go? You just painfully sniffed at it. You bring stuff that you stole, it goes on to say. I know I wrote it somewhere. You bring even stuff that you stole. Think about that. How, how can we bring stolen items to the Lord. Maybe we cheated on our time, maybe something stolen we offer to the Lord. We keep the best for ourselves, the, uh, the cleanest animal, the purest. We're like, I need this pure animal. I need to do my farm. But here's this other one that's okay. He's a, a, an animal and He's a little crippled, and I'll give him. You bring the sick again, he says it again. You bring the sick, you bring the lame, you bring that which is torn, and you offer me these things. So to me, the Lord is saying, you're just giving me your leftovers. You've been busy with your own agenda, your own work, your own efforts, your whatever it is you have. All week, putting all your focus and energy into other things, but yet, one day we come together, all you're left to give me is just the leftovers. Right. Just no heart, nothing. You weren't excited to come here. You just, the leftovers. And the last part says, should I even accept this out of your hand? Should I accept your leftovers and the little that you bring me, the crumbs that you place at my altar? Even my altar is not being used how it should be. You're not coming early to pray and wait before me. You don't see any of you praying here at the altar. So you might as well just shut the doors. Ooh, that's harsh. Remember, I'm not saying this. We read it. Malachi chapter 1. And it goes on in chapter 2. The same thing. Just calling the Lord. Just calling out their errors. But anyways, I want to ask you, what are you offering? Look at your life today, this morning. What are you offering the Lord today? And how are you offering it to the Lord today? Is it just your leftovers? Just barely anything that somehow you mustered yourself to come today, even though we snuffed at it and like, tired of this. This is right there. What a weariness it is, verse 13. Tired of this thing. Up. Are we just here just to be here? Do we just offer just to offer? With no feelings, with no emotion, no love, no excitement, no joy. Here you go, God, here's the money. I hope you're happy. I hope it's enough. We you look ahead to this week, what is on your to-do list for this week? What does it look like? Is God somewhere included in this week sometime? Is God on that list in your plan this week? How do you want to make, 
What, what are you doing to put God on your agenda this week? Who or what is at the top of your priority list for this week? Who or what do you want to please this week? Who or what do you want to make happy this week? Who are you going to put all your energy and focus for this week? Who do you not want to disappoint this week? Who do you want to prove yourself to this week? Man, God, your job, church. Amen. Maybe some of us say, I'm going to try to read this week. I'm going to try really hard to read His Word this week. I might pray a little bit this week. I'm going to try to pray a little bit this week. Try. This is a big question mark at the end. I might read. Maybe if I get some time this week, I get a little bored. Maybe I'll read my, my lesson. But the thing is, I'm so busy. Maybe if I get time. Why are we giving God our leftovers? Why is God just an afterthought? Why aren't His things important? Why isn't His ministry important? Why isn't your ministry at the top of your list? Why isn't your relationship with the Lord priority? Why isn't prayer priority? Amen. Why is this church priority not important or not important? And what about coming to the house of the Lord today? Do you really honestly try to make contact with God? Do you really try to reach out to Him and you sit there, God, just eyes closed and just concentrate? God, touch my heart. God, touch my life. God, I leave all this junk here with you. God, move on me. God, refill me. God, make a way for me. God, my family, my son, my wife, my husband. Do you do those things? Come here to try to make contact with the Lord? Do we come early to make your request known? Do you come to use this altar like the Lord says to ask yourself, God, all that's on your mind? Remember the Bible says, cast all of your cares. Cares means your worries, your anxieties, your pains. Put all those on me. Why do you lug it? Why do you why are you so used to packing all that muck and junk around with you when there's a, a chance you, for you to leave it all here and leave your happy and you know carefree and I don't understand sometimes. All God wants is for you to honor him. All God wants is for you to glorify him with all of your achievements, with all of your possessions, with all of your givings, even your job, God wants you to honor Him and glorify Him with, with your plans and with your goals. God wants to be the center of your life. He wants to be the center of the tension in your life. He wants your life and every plan that you ever made to surround Him, not including God wherever we can. We can honor Him with a lot of things, with our job. We can honor Him with our career. If you're a young person, you can honor Him with your education, your goals, your whole life. You can honor the Lord with. Amen. We miss it when we begin to think selfishly. Just for me, my own, my own situation. I've brought myself this far. I've done things this far on my own. My own way, my own thing, my own strength, my own will. I'm not doing this for anybody else but for me. You know, God doesn't really need all the stuff that He requires, like sacrificial givings, the money, the animals, and all that other stuff. He already owns everything. The world, the things above it, below it, everything. He already owns it. But what He really wants is you. Amen. That's all He wants. That's the only thing He's after is to have a relationship with you. 
He wants your love. He wants your commitment. He wants your trust. He wants you to rely completely on Him. He wants you to be thankful to Him. He wants to have a, a relationship with you. He wants your companionship. He wants to hear your voice. He wants to be, be, be your father and friend and a doctor. He wants to be all these things to you. Yeah. Our lesson says God is always faithful. Let's turn to Matthew chapter 3. Our lesson covers this towards the end if you read through it. Malachi chapter 3. You turn to Matthew, uh, Malachi. That's in Matthew. Malachi chapter 3. We can turn there. So before God went on this 400 year journey, his last most important words to his people were money, marriage, family, leadership, right? Money. Our lesson today is focused toward money. Verse 7, let's read there. It says, Yet from the days of your fathers you have gone away from my ordinance, and you have not kept them. The Lord says, Return to me, and I'll return to you, says the Lord. But you said, in what way shall we return? God says, you turned away from me. You go in the opposite direction. You've gone away from me. Lord calls them out again. And then the people say, the very bottom, the people ask the Lord, how shall we return then? And the Lord answers them in the very next verse, verse number 8. The Lord answers him and says, the bottom of verse 8, with your tithing and offering, with your money, will you rob God? You've robbed me. In what way you said have I robbed you? In tithing and offering. That's the first thing that the Lord responds after the people ask, what way? How shall we return? First thing is he goes to his, your tithing and offering is the road back to me. Isn't that something? You would think it'd be other things. Why our money? Why our finances? Our money is where our heart is. You know, when you begin to talk about tithing, offerings, finance, people get a little uncomfortable. It's a little tight, tense, right? Amen. So if you want to return to the Lord, if you want to come back to church, if you want to come back to the Lord and have prosperity once again, if you want to have His blessings once again, not just financial blessing, there's a whole bunch of different types of blessings, spiritual, financial, emotional, everything, those lists of blessings, prosperity, they go hand in hand. The Bible says the only way back is you have to begin to manage your money in biblical ways for you to return to that place. No wonder the Bible says in Ecclesiastes chapter 10 and verse 19, money is the answer for everything. Makes you happy, even makes you cry tears of joy. It's the answer for everything. And it's the same answer for our return to the Lord. So if you're finding a way back, you want to come back to church and to the Lord, but you say, but don't tell me anything about tithing. Don't tell me anything about giving. You're not going to last very long. You're not going to make it very long. There's a saying that goes, your treasure is where your heart is. Am I saying that right? Or your heart is where your treasure is. I think it makes sense both ways. If we 
we look, if we were to look at your checking account today, that will re reveal a lot to us, to you, where your heart is, where all your finances go. And the reason why it's always in the negative or always at zero. Amen. Read verse 8. It says, Will a man rob God? You have robbed me. The Lord says, You know there's a difference between a thief and a robber? A thief quietly sneaks in the back door and he's really sneaky and doesn't make a noise, doesn't even let you know you're there, and then takes what he gets, needs, and then he sneaks back out the door before you even know or realize what's missing. But the robber, on the other hand, comes in through the front door, kicks in your front door with a gun in his hand, demands something in your face and says, I'm taking this. I want this. That's what the Lord says. That's how we are. We're right in His face saying, I'm not giving this. I'm taking this. This is mine. We flat out tell the Lord, I'm not giving tithing. I'm not going to give tithing. I need this. This is mine. Like a robber breaking down heaven's door with a gun in our hand. That's, that's awful. Your treasure is where your heart is at. You know why you've been struggling? You know why people struggle? You know why we've struggled? I've even struggled. Because we're not giving back to the Lord what is already His. It's just one tenth. Imagine if I had ten dimes. I just take one dime and I set it over here and then I take the other ten dimes and then I take a bag of, I, I take ten apples or oranges. I take just one, set it over here and I can take all the others, all the other nine. If I have ten bags of salted pinions, I just take one bag, set it over here and I can enjoy the whole other nine bags of pinions. That's one tenth. Just and later on, if you continue to do that, look at the Lord's pile. Just a tiny little bit, but yet look at the pile of stuff that we get to keep. And that's all it takes the Lord to, to make our way back to Him. For Him to begin to bless our lives, our minds, hearts, everything. Again, I don't know if some of you have ever done this, but when you're paying your tithing, let's say it's like $50.76. I remember I used to do this. I was right down to the penny. I actually looked around just to make seven, exactly 76 cents. And then later on, I'm like, man, am I that cheap? And I can't even round up to $51? Am I that, that wicked? Am I that greedy? So I begin to round up a little bit. Amen. I'm not so cheap anymore. Verse 9, it says, You are cursed with a curse because you robbed me. Even this whole nation the whole nation, the Lord says, is doing it. Not just only that person or that person. Everybody's doing it. Everybody's in the same boat. Not only you. You should say amen to that and be relieved. Good, it's just not me. You're cursed with a curse. Everybody's doing it. Why is it a curse? Because it's holy, the Bible says, that one-tenth of of everything you get that's holy, thousands of years ago has been put into plan, put into the Bible. It's holy. That tenth is holy. So when we hang on to it and we keep it and we rob God, that holy thing becomes a curse on our life. The more we hold back, the more we 
take from God, those curses just keep piling up, piling up. Before we know it, that curse just buries us so deep that there's no, uh, we're, we're, we're in a bad place. You know, J Jacob gave, it wasn't hard for him. And look at the stuff that they had, like David, King David. Look at all the magnificent building, wonders of the world still. He gave. Imagine what his time was, a tenth of what David had. And look at what he built. There's no amount of money today probably that can equal to what David built for the Lord. And yet he gave a tenth of what he had. Imagine how much that was. And David, Abraham gave, Haggai gave, Zechariah we talked about. All these men paid their offerings, tithing to the Lord. And even if you read in Matthew, what does it say in Matthew? Even the hypocrites gave. Even the hypocrites tithed. What does that say? If you don't pay, and the hypocrites are doing it, and you're not, does that mean we're lower than a hypocrite? What do you even call that kind of... That's lower than a hypocrite. <laughs> I don't know what being lower than a hypocrite is. I don't have a name for it. We haven't even escalated. We haven't even advanced to becoming a hypocrite. Ooh. Jesus. Uh, yep. Jesus. We need to give to the Lord just that small tent. We can't keep keeping it. Amen. It's a curse. Right. We'll never get out of that hole that was stuck in. We'll never get out of that drama that we're used to. We'll, ne we'll never get out of those problems. We'll never get out of that hardship. We'll always be waiting for our hardship check. It might never come. <laughs> we say, how, God? How? The Lord told us how. Right there, you read it. With your tithing and offering. Start sowing the right way. Start being faithful. Start being obedient. Let's read verse 10. It says, Bring all the tithes into the storehouse, that there may be food in, in my house, and try me now in this. So where do we take our tithing? Do we give it? I, I've heard people say, Well, I give to this organization. I give back to the community. I give to this uh, this group and this charity. I send mine to... Or I, said, I was going to say Oral Roberts, but that's, that was back when I was a little kid. I remember my grandma giving to Oral Roberts. <laughs> but I, I give to, I don't know who people give to nowadays. Uh, uh. But anyway, I give my money to this and that. But the Lord says, you need to bring it to my house. The storehouse is his house. The storehouse is here. Bring it to God's house where you get taught. Bring it to the place where you get instructed. Bring it to the place where you are admonished and lifted up and encouraged. Amen. To his storehouse. You know, this church will never grow if we send our finances elsewhere. If we continue to keep it for ourselves, this church will never be, we'll never have a bigger church. We'll never get our own building if we send our funds other, other places. You'll never get teaching and preaching like we do if we don't if we keep continue to send our funds elsewhere. We'll always keep fundraising. And we're always going to continue to sell food, beans and fry bread. You know, we make fundraising the biggest ministry in the Ecclesia Church. You know that? All of our energy goes into fundraising. All our efforts go into fundraising. All our planning is around fundraising. How are we going to raise money? Do we better have enough of it? All our focus goes on uh, fundraising. It takes 90% of our time, and that 90% should be used other places, like devoting our time to planning for our Sunday school classes and planning for our lesson for Sunday, working maybe at our ministry outreach and 
and a street ministry and all these other things, our time could be used better. But yet we use it all for fundraising, all our money and our planning, everything is surrounding that. We're better than that. We're, we're too busy asking for dimes and pennies like those people you see on the corner. We're kind of like that. We're begging, hey, can you spare a dime? Can you spare a dollar? Anything you got. Verse 10, the last part says, try me. The Lord says, test me. Prove me. You know, I look forward to the day when we become a true tithing and offering church. I'm looking forward to the day when we are a blessed church, where we are giving back to the community, where we are starting ministry, where we give to the poor, where we give to uh, different charities in our community. I look forward to that day. When, you know, the Bible says people said, stop giving. I look forward to that day when we say that to the Lord. God, stop blessing us so much. Grossing out the seams. We've got everything we need. We have bands. We have schools. We have a big facility. We've got people. We've got workers. We've got pastors. We've got teachers. We're paying them all. And they have more than enough. I look forward to that day and say, God, can you stop blessing us for one day? You know, if we ever do get to that day, what you got to look forward to the day when we stop fundraising. Yeah. Yeah. Don't you look forward to that day when you don't have to give, you don't have to make another fry bread, you don't have to buy another oven mitt, you don't have to buy another cup filled with chocolate, you don't have to buy another brownie, a burnt brownie. That day, I look forward to that day. I wonder what that day would be like. It'd probably be like stepping into the twilight zone. What's this place? <laughs> Unusual. Things may be tight for us right now, but God says, try me. Yes. Test me. Prove me. And he goes on to say, I'm going to open the windows. Not just one window. There's a nest behind it. I'm going to open all the windows. The Bible says, I'm not just going to crack open the door a little bit. And I'm just not going to cause it to drift out of the door and between the cracks and the seals. I'm not going to just sprinkle it out. The Bible says I'm going to open all the windows and I'm going to pour out. Pour it all out. Amen. I love this, work, this last part and I'm going to close. It says, I will rebuke the devourer for you. A devourer is Something that ruins everything you buy. Your truck could have been brand new, but for some reason it's breaking down. You buy something and it's already broke. It doesn't last for very long. It devour. The Lord says, I'll rebuke that for you. Amen. Everything you buy seems to only last. You don't get the, the real um, everything out of it. Look at our Tahoe. Over almost 300,000 miles. And for, it's still running. That's still our number one automobile. <laughs> Everybody's got four or five brand new trucks. We still drive the old Tahoe. Look at my black pickup truck. It's, we have, I bought that before even Caleb was born. And it's still my number one work truck. It outdoes everybody when we go to the res. I'm not the one getting stuffed and flat tired. Everybody else needs a pull. And my truck is the one doing all the work. The Lord has rebuked the devourer in my life. And he can do the same for you. Whatever breaks down, if the Lord rebukes it, it's going to come back. Look, example, our heater broke down in the worst time of the winter and during the holidays. No stores open. Our heater breaks down. And if no stores open, what are we going to do? My family's going to freeze. So I, don't, I took the heater off and I kind of rubbed it, prayed a little bit wiped the dirt off of it and stuck it back in and it came back on to this day still running. The Lord rebuked the devour. He wanted to devour my heater. We're still here. Amen. Last one, verse 12. I'll bless you and all the nations will notice and call your name blessed. Everybody's going to notice that the Lord is blessing you. What's Get back on track. Yes. Everybody's going to acknowledge it. 